So, folks, today, I say this often about having special guests, but you're really going to want to tune in for this one. Today, we have Mr. DJ Vodica. The career of Donald DJ Vodica encompassed the rapid expansion of the prison system. For 16 years, he was a prison guard in California's highest security prisons, serving meals to gang leaders, serial killers in lockdown cells, and patrolling exercise yards filled with violent felons while unarmed and outnumbered a thousand to two. He belonged to an elite unit called the Investigative Services Unit, Internal Affairs, responsible for solving horrific crimes inside the walls. He was a decorated veteran officer. He became the sole whistleblower to, under, to uncover a group of rogue prison guards who called themselves the Green Wall. Welcome, DJ, and pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Aldra. It's, it's, it's an honor to be on your podcast and, and, and to talk with you and, and just anything in general that you need to know about what happened to me and my, me exposing the Green Wall. Yeah, yeah. The Green Wall. Before we get into that, because a lot of our viewers or listeners, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of jargon thrown in here that they may be unaware of. So I kind of want to give them some background. Can you explain what ISU is, Investigative Services is? For those who may not know, uh, Mr. Vodica, it was a correctional officer in the California Department of Corrections, and we're talking about the Investigative Services Unit. Uh, uh, unit. What, what is that, sir? Well, the ISU unit, each prison has an investigations unit, ISU, or otherwise known as the Goon Squad, and we're handpicked by the warden of that prison. He gets to hand choose who officer he wants in that unit. And, Basically, we work in a little different varieties. We, some of us are, are gang, uh, we validate gang members. We do, some of us are evidence officers, do all the crime scenes, and some of us are tool control. But we actually go uh, where we want to go, anywhere in, in the institution where the other officers are usually confined to a post. And, and uh, we, are, uh, we are very frowned uh, upon by the uh, inmate population and, and, and Basically, we, we know everything that's going on in the prison and our supervisors, they work the internal affairs aspect. They're the ones that investigate the, uh, the officers and staff, but we do assist the, uh, the sergeants and their supervisors when needed if they, they want us to act on that. Mm, yeah. It sounds like, you know, to give some context to folks out here, it sounds like uh, the FBI or the Central Intelligence Agency or something like that. Yeah, it is. It's, it's an elite unit. I mean, we wear, we wear the same jumpsuits, the green jumpsuits, but our patches are different. They're, they're black, and, and we wear a black hat with a little pin on it, and we have our patches say ISU on it, so we're, we're well recognized when we hit the yard. And we all, when we come on the yard, usually um, the yards get real quiet, and everybody turns and stares and sees where we're walking to, what housing unit we're walking into. And, and right away, the, the mindset of the incarcerated, the inmates thinking, oh, no, something's going to happen. Somebody's coming out of that that unit either in handcuffs or, or uh, some other way form, they're going to be coming out. So usually we know what's going on. We, we work, we work it and we have an investigation going on and then we, we go find what we need to find. Yeah. Yeah. And to let you folks know, you know, you all know my background and my experience and, and, and I will speak from experience what he's speaking about. We, we affectionately refer to as the goon squad. When the goon squad hit the yard, it meant something was happening. Something was going down or if something had gone down, they were here to get the culprits. And so you never wanted to see the goon squad come in for you because that was not a good thing. Correct. Right. Absolutely yeah. correct. I mean, we don't we don't just walk on the yard or in the facilities unless we have a purpose. Yeah, yeah. So how how did your what what got you into a career in uh, law enforcement in the California Department of Corrections? Well, I grew up in Camarillo, California, down in Ventura County in the, in the '80s, and I was playing college basketball. And I went to a junior college down there, and then I got a degree in criminal justice. And I always wanted to pursue t some type of law enforcement. And at the time in the 80s, nothing really was open. You know, the prison system wasn't even just start building. And then LA County Sheriff, all the local agency were hiring, there's a hiring freeze. And shortly after that, I, I joined the military. I, I went in the military, I went in the US Army after uh, I graduated uh, in 1982 from Fort Park College and ended up going spending time in Fort 
McBride, North Carolina, to assigned to a special forces unit back there. I spent four years there, and then about a year before I got out, my father said, "Hey, son, the California Department of Corrections is hiring, and uh, they're looking for officers. They're building these prisons, like a wide span of them." So I said, "Yeah, hey, pop, send me an application." So my dad sent me an application. And I filled it out out in North Carolina. And then when I got home, they were testing. They tested me. And my first assignment was uh, Corkman State Prison. And uh, after I got out of the academy in uh, 80, March of 88, I ended up at Corkman State Prison. That was my first duty assignment for the Department of Corrections. Yeah, yeah. And, and folks, uh, DJ has a book out called The Green Wall. A prison guard's struggle to expose the code of silence in the yard largest prison system in the United States, and he was gracious enough to send me a copy. And uh, let me tell you, it, it's a hell of a read. I, I encourage everyone to uh, purchase this book. If you want to know more about the, uh, the the prison industrial complex beyond what they tell you about in the news media. Pick up this book. It, it's a hell of a read. And, and DJ, one of the things that I noticed while I was reading was the parallel of the feelings and the emotions that, that you describe in the book as a quote unquote fish officer. And, and it reminded me of being, you know, a, a, a fish prisoner. Some of the same thoughts, some of the same fears. Can, can you go into that a bit? What was it like for you as, as, as a fish officer? It was scary, you know, Andre. It was my, you know, coming out of the academy, you know, new environment, you know, coming from a, a middle class family, not knowing what, you know, what's going to be behind the walls and senses, and then you, you're stepping in a total different world. I mean, I'm going in there with convicted felons, you know, guys are doing life and they don't really care, and, and you just you get that you step into an area. This is their area, you know. This is where they live. This is them 24/7. And right away, you, you have to show that respect to these guys. You know, if you give them respect, which I did, I didn't have a problem. I mean, I had convicts and inmates when I first started at Cork when I was a yard officer, a couple months into it, you know, I had a good crew and, and they'd come up and, and speak to me with that respect and I gave them that respect back. But we had a lot of officers that disrespected the, the, the inmate population and, and they, they got dealt with severely either by us or, or by the inmate population. They, they let us know, hey, hey, why is this officer disrespecting us? And um, it's all, all about how you talk to these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 what really stood out for me is, you know, because here at Inside Circle, we're always trying to, you know, create spaces of healing. And for every human being, they have the opportunity to, you know, to just be. And and what really struck me was the potential there to, to detach from humanity as a means of survival and creating a persona to project in order to feel safe because it's something that I myself am very familiar with, you know, is, is that something that you can identify? Absolutely, with? I mean, I mean, you, you, like I said, you're, you're, we're outnumbered, you know, and mm -hmm. I wanna go home every night. That's, that was my main goal to go home every night. You know, I mean, yeah, we're outnumbered and, and safety was a, a number one thing for us as staff members. But, you know, it's just uh, either, you know, either you go home or you don't go home. I mean, there's times when I was on the yard, I worked 16 hour days. I mean, sometimes I wanted to go home and we couldn't because there was a riot or some type of thing happening in the yard. And, and uh, it's a different world, completely different world. Mm -hmm. And and that's a piece that, you know, I kind of want to drop in here so that people can 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 identify with 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 your humanity with the humanity of the people who walk that line and do that job because it's very easy to get caught up in looking at prison or the prison industrial complex and just see it as an entity and within that entity there are humans who are just trying to do a job they have families they have people who care about them and love them and and their desire is to be able to feed their family you know do the right thing and make it home at night in one piece, just like anybody else, they just happen to work in prison. So I, I you know, I, I don't want the people who are listening to miss that piece. And you know what, Elder, and the same, same thing with the, the MA population. You know, some of those guys, you know, they were programming, they did the right thing, you know, and, and they have families on the streets too, you know, and they want to go home safe when they get a chance to go on parole. They don't, 
they don't want to end up doing more time. And, and these guys on the green wall, I mean, these guys part of the green wall, they, they, they were a, a gang, a, a actual a gang uh, inside the prison as a peace officer. And these guys would do uh, horrific crimes against the incarcerated. You know, they were setting them up for more time, giving them their third strike. Uh, they did whatever they wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so right there, you you bring up the green wall. Can you can you give us a little bit of insight into what that is, what that entails for the uninformed? Well, the green wall is uh, basically, as officers in the Department of Corrections, we wear green jumpsuits, so they identify themselves as the green wall, or they wear their khaki khaki shirts, green pants. But, but the green wall it reflects on the uniforms we wore. They were an elite unit, I mean, not elite, but they were a, a hand-picked unit by the warden at the prison, at Salinas Valley State Prison. That's where it all started in 1998 after the Thanksgiving riot. Um, they took uh, upon themselves, they were, they were above the law, they could do nothing wrong because they had the backing of the warden. And the warden told these guys, hey, go put fear and intimidation to these inmates. They're not gonna run my prison. We're gonna take full control of this prison do whatever you have to do. I don't care if it's illegally, criminally or whatever, but I'm going to be in charge of this prison. Mm -hmm. And so what, what are some of the things that, that the green wall was responsible for? Some of the things that they did? Well, for instance, uh, I was working on 1998, November of 1998. I was working at SAG on DR at Salinas Valley State Prison. And at that time during the holiday, Thanksgiving holidays, no administration there, less, uh, skeleton crew of officers and staff and what happened there was an alarm on the upper yard and D yard and we responded up there and when I got out of that yard across the, the concrete uh, by the wall but in, into the yard through the door there was uh, several southern Hispanic inmates already laid on the prone position on the grass on the concrete and several staff members were coming through the gate and they were injured and some of them had stabbings or lacerations and bruises and blood and all that so off Greg Lewis, he, he was my uh, partner up to Pelican Bay, and then he came down to Salinas when we acted Salinas, and uh, he asked me, "Hey, DJ, you've done, you know, you were an evidence officer for a lot of institutions. Can you go grab the camera cook equipment and, and do my crime scene?" And I said, "Absolutely." So I uh, I gathered that it, that stuff up, and then I worked right away. I ended up going to the outside hospitals where a lot of staff members were getting rushed uh, via ambulance to the outside hospital where. I met them there, I took their photographs, collected whatever evidence from them, and then I re responded back to the institution and photographed the crime scene. And then uh, I told Lieutenant Lewis, I said, hey, I need to photograph these inmates prior to being housed in their housing units to see if they have any injuries, extended injuries on them. So I told the officers to escort them up to the hobby room where I wanted to take pictures of these guys. Well, some of these guys, about my size, I'm, I'm 6'5", 320 pounds, so I'm a big guy. And, some of these guys, part of the green wall, my size, and part of the ISU unit. Later on, they were part of the ISU unit. And um, they, they got a little upset. Some of them walked in and said, what, what, what the F are you doing, Mr. Officer DJ? What are you doing? Man? What do you, why are you an inmate lover? Why are you photographing these guys? And they didn't like it, what I was doing because they know that they wanted to tune these guys up sometime you know, for attacking staff. So mm -hmm. later that, that day, they escorted them back to their housing and this is back, and they actually tuned them up, you know, tuned them up and they beat them down, left a lot yeah. of marks on them and uh, destroyed their property. And soon enough, uh, that hit Sacramento and the internal affairs unit at Sacramento came down and did a big investigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and as a result of you doing your job and taking photographs, that kind of set uh a series of events in motion for you. Yeah, I did. I mean, I ended up, when they came down from uh, Sacramento about two months later, they came down with the team, internal affairs, and they called me up to the office to, to talk to them about all the pictures I had. And, and at the office, there was a, a union rep. We have union reps at the prisons, you know, that represent us, and they report back to the higher headquarters in CCPOA. And uh, they asked me, hey, uh, we're going to go and sit in this interview with you. And I looked at the guy and said, I don't need you. Why do I need you? I didn't do nothing wrong. I'm, I'm going in there to talk, you know, whatever they need. And I spent about two and a half hours in there with them going through all the individual pictures and, and, and explaining their injuries and all that. And shortly when I left that area, then I was, I, was, I was labeled a rat, dead man, walking, you're a snitch. 
why are you why are you working with internal affairs and uh, you're on their side and and I was ostracized. I had officers not walk with me. I had officers uh, shun me. And then uh, I ended up requesting to work in the uh, vehicle sally port where the buses come in and all that work away from mm-hmm. the staff members. And, and that's why I ended up uh, going down there until I was uh, ordered later on uh, by the warden at that prison, Warden Lamarck, to write a report about staff misconduct, what I saw, what I do. And I had to share that report and, and I really didn't want to. I walked up to him and he said, I need you to write this report. And I told, told Mr. Lamarck, I work with these guys. What are you going to do to protect me? He goes, I'm ordering you to write this report. You need to write this report. I said, okay, I'll write it. So I gave it to him. And, and then about two months later, here comes these guys, part of the green wall from the ISU unit down the vehicle's sally port and entered the sally port and they wanted to talk to me. And they quoted verbatim everything out of my memorandum that I gave the warden. He showed my report to these guys. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds, what I'm hearing there is, is, is betrayal. That sounds like a tremendous betrayal of, of, of trust and of the office and, and <laughs> knowing what I know about, you know, the green wall and, and some of the things that go on in there. Sounds like your life was put in danger. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm in an institution where guys were in for 85% where I'm for murder, you know, and these guys on the green wall, I mean, you know, they, they work with other inmates and, you know, they were all different uh, races. They worked with the white inmates and Hispanic inmates, uh, African-American inmates. Uh, you know, all they had to do was give them some, either some drugs or a cell phone or whatever. And hey, we need you to take this officer out. And, and it probably would have happened at Salinas, but I tried, I, I didn't want to go that far. I, I knew I was a marked man, a dead man walking. My phone would ring every day. You rat, you snitch, you're done. You know, you never have a career in the Department of Corrections. And so I, I lost it. They came down there again. They, they confronted me and I, I, I lost it. And, and then the internal affairs sergeant, uh, Sergeant Donahue, who I worked with at Pelican Bay at the time on the ISU up there. He's no longer with us. He passed away about eight years ago, but he, um, stood by my side. He said, I'm going to get somebody to come down and talk to you. I'm going to call the OIG, the Office of Inspector General. They came down and they pulled me out and put me in an SUV and, uh, near my house. And we, I told them everything on tape. And then about three weeks later, they raided the institution. They came in with a full crew and emptied out the internal affairs unit, the ICE unit. They emptied, told the warden, Lamarck, to step out of the office and took files and boxes and all that. And they did a big investigation and uh, sort of still left me hanging there. You know, I'm like, wow, you guys really put me in life in danger now. I, I, I'm a marked man, I'm a dead man. You know what I mean? By my, either my staff or or even by the inmates. So I contacted Joe Renoso, a good friend of mine. He was, he's in the book and he's my mentor, my, my good friend. He's, I documented everything, told him everything. And he's the one who got me out of the institution. They moved me overnight to another prison overnight for my protection. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that you you took an oath and you had a job and you took the job seriously and you did what you told the people of the state of California that you would do. And because of that, you were labeled by others who had taken the same oath. You were labeled a rat, a snitch, and, and, and your life was put uh, in jeopardy. What, what did that feel like? Oh, it just it felt like that um, I had nobody, nobody to back me, nobody, you know, it's just like my whole world just turned upside down. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I, I had a family at the time. I had a, a girlfriend. I had a, actually, she was my wife and, and she couldn't handle all of it at the time. And, and uh, she, we ended up divorcing shortly after that. And, uh, I uh, ended up going on, uh, out on stress with PTSD and, and then later on, I testified in the Senate hearings in 2004. I was invited to government oversight. Uh, two senators, Jackie Spear of uh, San Francisco and Gloria Romero. And then I ended up going to testify in Sacramento about the green wall for about two hours. And then shortly after that, after I left that, they moved me off the grid. I uh, ended up going to Northern California in an isolation area for six months until everything started calming down for what I exposed. That's heavy. Yeah, it was. It was, you know, it was way up in Northern California. It was a beautiful country. It, it brought up, you know, just they wanted to de-escalate me and just 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 let everything go. And 
not to think about it. But it's sort of scary, you know, you're going on a highway and all of a sudden you, you, at night you turn it off an area, you pitch dark, you don't know where you're going, but these guys knew where they were going and ended up going through two lock gates and then uh, all the way up to these two back cabins. And in the book, I don't know if you've seen it yet, Elder, but there's a yeah. picture of the cabin and in the, in the picture of the snow plow that we came out in during the snow. And I got up there on January 21st, 2004. I, uh, I arrived there that night and I got up the next morning and there was a feet of snow on the ground. And, and a beautiful area, beautiful country. And I was way away from, nobody could find me. I mean, I mean you did, you, you be, uh, there's only one gate, two gates in and two gates out. That's the only way in and out. And yeah. It was isolated and quiet. And I stayed there for about five or six months. And hmm. so I had to come out and test this, you know, through my deposition testimony. Yeah. And, and, and the way that my brain works, it works with pictures. And as you were describing that, what it, what it, what it felt like to me was my ride heading up to Pelican Bay and, and, and you know, rides the corker into the shoe. And, and I heard you use the term isolation. So I wonder, having, you know, had the, uh, the profession that you had had and been around shoes, been in the hole, and then moving into a place like that, not knowing where you're going, but they know where they're going and then they turn off to some road, some God forsaken place. What the hell was that like? Where am I going? That's the thing, where am I going? You know, I have no, when, when I was back there, you didn't, I didn't have cell service, you know, and where, where we were at. I mean, she didn't have a, you know, the person that was up in the front cabin, I was in the back cabin. She didn't, she didn't have cell phone, um, you know, we had cell phones, but no, no means to use it up there because we were in between two huge mountain ranges. And so anytime I needed to call out, I had to go with her into sort of into town and use my cell phone. But I mean, it's just, it's like, there's to me, it was like nobody on the face of earth. It, it, it's just me and her, that's it. And her dogs and uh, just totally uh, isolated. Mm-hmm. What, what goes on inside of you as you're, you're, you're experiencing this isolation and your mind is going through whatever it's going through behind the system that now you're, you're in the shoe. You're yeah. in that seg. You're, you're, it's like I'm locked up, you know? It's like I'm locked up where I can't go anywhere. I mean, I could, but I didn't want to go anywhere. I mean, I, I just exposed the Department of Corrections at the biggest hearing in, the, in, in California. And also it was, it was live media. It, it was on Fox News. It went state, it went national. I mean, my, my story hit the front page of the LA Times when I testified in the Senate hearings in 2004. And uh, nobody really knew about the Green Wall. The public didn't know, the media didn't know. I'm um, somebody incarcerated me who these guys were, but I exposed it. I opened up a can of worms because the warden at that prison threw me under the bus. I mean, he, he, he set me up, you know, and, and now, now it's my time to expose these guys that were corrupt. Mm-hmm. 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 Are you still in touch with any of your uh, former co-workers? The only person I'm in touch with is uh, Joe Renoso. Yeah. Um, the other friends that I thought I had friends in the Department of Corrections that I hung out with and, and, and did stuff with, and they, they didn't want anything to do with me anymore. And at the time I was, you know, my, my, my lawyer, Lanny Tron, we do communicate every once in a while. And he stays in touch with me. And then, uh, um, you know, Joe Renoso does. And then, you know, uh, and then, you know, my son, I have a little boy and, and uh, I, I don't know if you probably read it, if you read it in the book already, but we, we I attended, a, he wanted to go to a fair in Pass Robles, California. And when my mom and dad were still alive, they were down at Pismo Beach. And I used to take him down there to see their first grandson. And my little boy who's five years old wanted to go to the fair. And I took him to that fair that night and I was wearing my bulletproof vest because I wore that wherever I went. And, and I had my weapon with me wherever I went in California. And uh, as we were leaving the fair, uh, coming out the fair, uh, one of the supervisors, sergeant there, ran up on me, approached me and told me to drop the case. These are my friends. You're a rat, you know, leave, leave it alone, let it go, let it go. And, it startled me and it startled my little boy and he started crying and I had to get him out of there right away. He doesn't, yeah. he didn't even see that. Yeah, it, it sounds like you were catching grief from not just the green wall, but everybody that was in green. Oh, everybody, because they are, they knew me. I mean, I, shortly after that, um, 
I think it's right after that I testified, you know, in 2004. And then uh, just, uh, it, it's hard. I, I just, nobody, you know, I took down, I went up, well, I didn't, I took down a lot of staff members, part of the Green Wall and, and, and the warden. I mean, the warden, you know, I took him down and, and um, you know, I, I went all the way to the director's level, but I went up against 30,000, you know, staff members, correctional staff members, and they all knew about the Green Wall and they knew who I was. And, in my own union, you know, my own union, the CCPOA, the CCPOA, my own union. I asked for help. I went to the chapter president, Mikey Menace at the time. And I looked at him, I said, Mike, I'm trying to get a hold of you several times. And he looked at me like this, Eldra, and he looked at my nameplate and he goes, oh, you're off Stravonica. I said, yeah. He said, I can't help you. And he turned away and walked away from me. My own chapter president, who's supposed to protect me? He turned his back and walked away from me. And not to talk to me. And, his, and I'm like, I've been paying union dues for 16 years or whatever. And, and, he, and he, he says, I don't want to, you can't, you know why? Because they investigated the dirty staff. Yeah. Yeah. So what, you know, and, and, and I'm wondering as, as a listener of this, what, goes through the minds of the listeners and you know what goes through your mind when you think about a labor union 30,000 strong and they are not supporting one of their own who did the right thing what faith does that engender in the system that they they protect the corrupt i mean they they protect the corrupt they don't want to they don't want to protect the good because you know, if they put, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, guys that come forward and do what I did. Matter of fact, there's nobody that ever did what I did. There's no book. You know, there's like this book that you have, The Green Wall. Never, there's never, and you probably, you know, never written, any, anybody's ever written against the Department of Corrections who challenged the Department of Corrections. And I, this book's been out since 2009, Eldred, and I've never been challenged on any, everything in this book, you, you've read it, there's names in the book, everything. Is everything in this book? I have all the documentation to support it. And everything yeah. in this book's true. And, and you know what? They've banned, they've banned my book to go inside the prison. It's not on the ban list. Listen to this. It's not on a ban list. As I look, they just don't want it to go inside the prison. If they catch this book going through the prison, they'll pull it. But yeah. it's not on the ban list. So you yeah. really can't take it. You really have to let it go through. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, and, and I can, you know, testify myself, I was incarcerated during this time period. And there's a such thing known as, as the, the information pipe pipeline, the prison pipeline. And I remember when all of this was going on, you know, we receive information from, you know, cohorts at other prisons and what's going down and names and all of that stuff. And folks, yeah, the shit is true. This is this is what was going on in there. And, and, and to a degree, you know, I've been out six years now, so I don't know, but I do hear things. It, it's definitely something that we need to work on collectively as, as a society if we want to have any sort of healing. This is. It has to, uh, yeah, because, you know, I mean, the California elder, the green wall is still going on. I mean, I've been contacted by outside lawyers uh, like last week or two weeks ago. And they just, you know, they, they're representing an inmate to uh, two guys at a sac up in the Sacramento area. And, and they just filed a 160 page uh, legal brief. And they cited my story in there. They cited my book. They cited my, and, and, and officers are throwing up that green wall again. Hey, we're part of the green wall. It happened at New Folsom. This is ongoing at New Folsom. And just recently, a few months back, it happened at RJD in San Diego, down in California, where it, uh, Green Wall members who call themselves the Green, they were violating the ADA, the uh, the handicap inmates down there. They were abusing them down there and all that. And and just recently, a federal court judge ruled against the department, told the Department of Correction, all these officers will start wearing body cameras, which they should wear body cameras. I mean, it'll you know it'll protect the incarcerated, it'll protect the, those officers wearing the body cameras, but you know they should have been wearing them a long time ago. And it, yeah. there's, there's so many lawsuits going on with these guys and it's, it's costing the taxpayers of California a lot of money. So reform definitely has to be within the prison. We have to get rid of these rogue prison guards, not just slap them on the hand and, and give them a 30 day suspension or whatever. They need to, they need to be terminated from that position. Yeah. 
and and knowing what I know about the the CCPOA, the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, I'm going to uh, assume that that's not an easy task. They're one of the strongest labor unions in this country. They're most powerful. Yes, they are. You know, they're 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 deep. They got money in their, their pockets. Uh, they can choose who they want to deal with. You imagine this: you've got thirty thousand correction officers at a hundred dollars a pop each month. That's three billion dollars a, a month going into their their pockets. You know, and and that's what thirty six million dollars a year. <laughs> I mean, they they pick and choose who they want as a governor. They pick and choose who they want as district attorney of that county. You know, they got money to donate. Yeah. And, uh, but they didn't donate for my cause, you know, and I stood up against them. And, you know, in, in the Senate hearings, in the 2004 Senate hearings, Mike Jimenez had to testify. Remember? And Rod Hickman, you remember who Rod Hickman was? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah, I Rod, do. Rod Hickman was my captain. At, uh, when I was an ISU officer at Calipatria, he was my captain. We knew each other very well. He knew who I was. And, you know, I'm going to say a little story. We, uh, right when uh, everything started to kick off, I had to go use the restroom in the state capitol and Joe Renoso escorted me to the hallway and I went to the restroom and I was in the restroom and guess who walks in the bathroom? It's Rod Hickman. He comes up there. He goes, hey, DJ, how you doing, buddy? I said, Rod, you know what's going on. I goes, yeah, we're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to get to the bottom of this. It's not right for what they did to you. And uh, he knows. He knew right then, you know, but he had, he had to, uh, you know, approach the way he had to approach it. And, uh, you know, and, 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 I, and I admire Rod. I like Rod. And, um, you know, he, he stood for what he was, and he, he saw the, the direction the Department of Corrections was going after I testified. And I think he only lasted like six months, and he like, I don't want any part of this, and he retired as a secretary, as a secretary of correction, who answered to Schwarzenegger. And, uh, like I said, the union, uh, they didn't want no part of me. And, you know, I, my lawyer said, let's go after the union. I said, no, nah, I don't want it. I mean, I could have went after the union for not failing to protect me, but I had to bury my father. My father, uh, when I came out of hiding, his last words to me all to were, hey, you know what, son, me and your mom are proud of you. We're proud for what you stood for. And, you know, and his last words were on the deathbed. He said, write, write a book, son. Write this book. Get it out to everybody. Tell them everything what they've done to you and, and share it with everybody who wants to read it. And that's what I did. And that's what I did. That was what's right there. And, yeah. and you're, you're reading yours right now, so... Yeah, yeah. Again, folks, the book is titled The Green Wall, A Prison Guard's Struggle to Expose the Code of Silence in the Largest Prison System in the United States. Uh, check it out. You need to get it. You need to uh, uh, bring it into your book clubs. You need to put it in our schools. We need to be educated about this. Uh, uh, information is knowledge and power. And, and that's the only way that we can have any real uh, reformation is to be informed and use our power. Uh, DJ, question for you. What is your greatest fear today? Dying. <laughs> you know, I mean, I want to die a pro proper way. I want to die of old age. I want to die of, you know, something God wants me to come up and see him, you know. I, I just don't want to uh, take a bullet from somebody that I, I, I probably, you know, got you know, fired or terminated or, you know, the biggest thing is somebody knocking at my door and I open the door and getting you know, shot or my family get hurt, that kind of stuff. But just to move on every day, to live every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's really sad and I hope it's not it missed on our listeners that we have a law enforcement officer here talking about his greatest fear being killed by other either current or former law enforcement officers for him doing the right thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, prison reform is huge in the United States, especially in California. I mean, there has to be change. You know, you have to treat these guys as humans, not like call them an inmate this or, you know, you know, hey, inmate come over here. To me, that's like, you know, that's just talking to me or talking down to them. And, and we, we need to start treating these guys with, with being a lot more humane. I think if you did that, you'd have a less staff assaults, less, you know, a lot of stuff, less fights, less riots, less everything on the yard. And these, these officers need to be more heavily trained in the code of silence. You know, I mean, the code of silence is huge and they really don't talk about it in the academy. Although they don't they really talk about it because they, they don't, they just don't want to, you know, I think 
it's part of their their curriculum. They just don't want to talk about it, and they just mm -hmm. you have to experience for yourself. And you, you know, I look at every not every correction officer in the Department of Corrections is bad. It's just that selective mm -hmm. view that made it hard. It made it hard on all of, all of us. And then I saw wrongdoing, and I had an obligation as a peace officer to report it, and that's what I did. I took an oath. I took an oath to protect and serve. I took an oath, you know, not to follow the code of silence. I, I took an oath, and, and that's what I stood for. Yeah, yeah. So let's play make believe and pretend here. And if DJ had the opportunity to design and run prisons, the California correctional system, what would the training look like? What would the system look like if you were in charge? Uh, it'd be definitely, uh, I'd, I'd revamp a lot of stuff. I'd revamp, you know, the, the background investigations with these, what these people are coming through. And, you know, I think uh, a high school diploma is, is okay, but I would want a more advanced, like in a, a two-year college degree or higher, um, know a little bit more about, you know, the background of, uh, talk a lot about the code of silence. I mean, bring that stuff up a lot because, uh, what is right and what is wrong, you know, and, and just, uh, a lot of classroom time, you know, a lot of classroom time, a lot of scenarios. You know, we didn't have a lot of scenarios in the academy. I mean, we're just throwing in there and uh, just to clean up the operations, you know, and, and try to try to bring more programs in for the inmates and incarcerated. When I was in in 1988, there was, uh, you know, stuff for the inmates to do behind the wall, you know, hobby, auto body, you know, small engine repair and all that. They took all that away. I mean, why? Because it's money. Everything has to do with money. And uh, I, I would just make a big change in the Department of Corrections and how mm -hmm. the public, how the public views the Department of Corrections, how the media sees it. I mean, nobody, the media can't even get inside the prison system. Anymore. They, they don't know what the wrongdoing is. And, you know, and I see all this media stuff on National Geographic about lockdown and how these prisons, are, they're, they're showing the bad side of that. Why not talk about the bad side about the officers and what they're doing to make it hard on the incarcerated? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you use today for uh, self-care? How do you take care of DJ? Oh, I stay out of California. <laughs> 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 I stay out of California. I don't live in California. And, you know, and, and I only, I travel to California if I have to, but you know, I mean, uh, I get up in the mountains and we travel, me and the wife, and you know, we, we just enjoy each other. We're, we don't do a lot of stuff with other people. And um, we just, we, had, we got a couple of dogs and we hang out with our dogs. And we just enjoy life that, you know, we can travel. And, and uh, everybody tells me to write a second book, but I, I, I don't want to write a second book. And, you know, I mean, the, from what I understand right now, I've got a, a supposedly a, a movie in development for the Green Wall. And, and I also have a, a possible documentary coming out on the green wall. I mean, there's some people very interested in LA and Hollywood and it needs to be exposed. And, and you bringing me on this podcast inside circle, I think it's great. And you know, I, this podcast is great out because it's one of the best ones I've been on. And I've been on a lot. My story has been to the UK. My story is I've been in the Philippines. I've been to Australia. I've been to the UK a couple of times on podcasts, but I feel strong and positive on yours. Thank you. Thank you. That 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 really means a lot. And it, it's ironic. Me and the fellas were talking. I was just like, oh, if my friends could see me now. <laughs> ISU and number H08157 sitting down for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, having, a, having a cup of coffee, you know, and, and here, here comes the union and the CCK union into that little coffee shop. And they, they look at us and do that double take, and like shake their heads and go, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. What, as, as a person, as an individual, is there something, and I'm asking this because of who we are and what we do, and we're always trying to create spaces for people to look at themselves and self-development. Is there something that you as a person are internally working on that's really difficult for you? Um, try not to think about this every day, you know, the green wall. I mean, you know, my wife, you know, and I love her to death. We've been together 15 years. and. And it's all about the green wall, the green wall, the green wall, the green wall, you know, and it takes a toll on, toll on us sometimes, but I just, one day I just want to forget about it, just completely forget about it, you know, and I'm self-medicating.
complicated because I do have a PTSD uh, an award from the Department of Corrections for uh, stress and, and what I what I exposed and I just one day I just want to forget about it and just not even not even open the book anymore not even talk about the book anymore hopefully that happens one day you know but right now I just want to get it out there I mean people really need to know what happens behind the walls in the California Department of Corrections because it's not fair to people like you uh, other officers that have to go in there every day and, and then think about hey am I going to be with the green wall am I going to am I going to go along with it or, or not go along with it you know if you don't go along with it you're going to be ostracized and and they're going to they're not going to back you they're not you know you have to be a part you know it's like in the prison system there's gangs everybody knows there's prison gangs in the prison system well, there's a gang that's called the Green Wall, the Department of Corrections that's formed. And uh, it just needs to be uh, cut out completely. Yeah, yeah. Give us three things that you're proud of yourself for. Writing this book, telling my story, uh, uh, just uh, that was, that's probably the biggest things I'm proud for. And then, uh, having a solid uh, foundation right now, you know, and then just uh, living every day by day, you know, and just uh, breathing that air. Yeah, yeah. If, if, and, and if you could see six-year-old DJ. What's that? If you could see six-year-old DJ when you were six years old, before you grew up, before you started playing sports and, and went off into your life, in, in your mind's eye, if you can picture little six-year-old DJ and, and walk up to him, what advice would you give him? Do the right thing. Do the right thing and uh, just make sure you, you feel good about yourself, what you did. You know, just do the right thing and, and move forward and, and uh, strive for every goal that you want to be but make sure you do the right thing yeah yeah not bad advice at all is there anything that we have not touched on that you'd like to leave the people with today just uh just Eldo, just you know if you can get the word out about the book and about the story and about this great podcast that you have and and just uh we just have to have change in the department of corrections and either in California or also in the United States. I mean, there's, there's good and bad, and, you know, we just need to get, get rid of the bad all the way up to upper administration because it all starts up high, and it trickles down to the lower uh, the officers. And we just and ha and have a better, safe environment for the incarcerated behind the walls in California and to the United States that we just have to get rid of these rogue prison guards. They're, they're making it hard on these guys. You know, it's not fair. The court, the court's the ones that put them there. We didn't. The officers didn't put them there. Just you know, let let them do their time, and if they're, they got a time to go out and, and they can make it out home safely, let them do their time. Don't give them more time. Don't you know? Just don't abuse your power just because you wear a badge on your chest. Don't be above the law. Yeah, yeah. Well, you heard it here, folks, from uh, DJ. Don't be above the law. Again, the book is called The Green Wall, a prison guard struggle to expose the code of silence in the largest prison system in the United States. And we will have links to where you can get this in the comments below. So uh, thank you, DJ, for coming in and sharing your story and for uh, standing up and, and, and doing what you told six-year-old DJ to do. Thanks, Audra. I appreciate it. And hopefully you enjoy the book at the end. And and if you get a chance, just leave an Amazon or some review on it or something like that. And we'll definitely stay in contact. I'll, I'll definitely stay in contact. Thank you very much, sir.